This week on the Backtable Podcast. I interviewed a colleague actually who quit operative urology. He was a you know, well-known urologic oncologist and quit operating probably 10 years before he had planned to because of pain and told his story at a grand round. And yet, I don't think he said the word pain, but maybe once. He said discomfort and he said stiffness about 20 times. So there's just this sense that like, well, that doesn't really hurt. So, you know, I do think that even in how we talk about things and how we respond to surveys, there's generational differences and cultural differences that kind of vary based on people's age. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Backtable Urology Podcast, your resource for all things urology and then some. You can find previous episodes of Backtable Urology Podcasts on iTunes, Spotify, and backtable.com. So please check us out. I'm Dr. Suzette Sutherland, your host today for this exciting episode. Today, I have the distinct pleasure of having Dr. Kristen Krauser here with me from the University of Michigan, here to talk to us about the importance of ergonomics, especially as surgeons. This episode is appropriately entitled, I Love My Job, But It's Killing Me. And we're referring to the plethora of aches and pains that we can experience after a long day in the OR or maybe even in the clinic. And some of these issues can lead to even sometimes disability or feeling like you need to retire early because of the physical pain that people are having. So this can really be a huge issue. So I'm really excited to have Dr. Krauser here today to talk to us about this important topic. Thanks, Dr. Krauser, for being here. Thanks for having me. So when I looked up ergonomics, I found a definition of the science of adapting the job, the equipment, and the humans to each other for optimal safety and productivity. Can you elaborate on that definition and specifically how that relates to surgeons? Well, I think that's certainly a a big piece of what especially lay people think of ergonomics on that sort of physical side. But for surgeons, I think it helps to think about the entire domain of human factors or ergonomics is sort of divided into like physical ergonomics, which is things like posture. And that's where sort of the musculoskeletal pain angle comes in and how we relate to our environment and what like what our job requires of us and the use of equipment and things like that. So obviously there's a lot that has to do with surgery, especially in urology, so many different modalities of surgery, but also in the clinic. As you mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of people's workstations aren't really optimized physically. But I think the other piece that's interesting about ergonomics is that, or human factors as I'll often call it in the United States, is that that's that physical domain. But then there's also what we call cognitive ergonomics, which has to do with teamwork and decision making and even some sort of psychomotor skills and things like that. So there's that domain, but then there's also this organizational ergonomics domain, which I think is something we often really forget about, which is sort of the systems level of ergonomics. So how the system influences us. And, you know, for surgeons, we all know that whether our operating room has dedicated teams or how the scheduling is done or how the equipment is packaged or sterilized can make a huge difference in how our day goes. So What's been fascinating to me as I've gotten more interested in this field is that it really encompasses so much of what, you know, can make me crazy about being a urologist. But also when it works well, it's great. I mean, I think today that, you know, our goal is to to look at the physical side of things. But I think it's fascinating to realize it's like it's even more than that. So interesting field. That's really very interesting. We definitely think about the physical aspect of that. But you bring up a really good point that I'd love to just explore a little further is especially even post-COVID here, right? Where so many of our, you know, well-oiled machines, our teams are no longer that because so many people have either left medicine or we rely on many travelers now. There are so many different people in the OR with us and sometimes we're meeting them for the first time. And so do you think that that's contributing to even more issues? Absolutely, because... You know, if you think about even as it relates to the physical domain, a lot of physical ergonomics is how your space is set up. So how high your table is or where your screens are or how your equipment's arranged. And a lot of that might be on your case card, but a lot of that is in the mind of your team. And if you have a dedicated team, they know what you like 
They know we do it the same way every time, right? And they know how that way is and how it's sort of evolved over time. And they understand how the equipment in that particular hospital works. I just finished a microscoped case today and, you know, we have like three different microscopes and depending on the day, I can be on the trouble bus for a long time just based on the fact the staff doesn't understand how one of the microscopes works. So I do think that it isn't just us and our environment. That environment includes the people that we work with and we have to have a team that's a well-oiled machine if we're going to get the job done efficiently, that's for sure. Right. So that message just needs to be heard loud and clear by the hospital administrators, right? Because they're just thinking about a well-oiled machine for productivity issues and efficiency so that we can then clear the room and get another patient in and be productive for them. But really, if they're not paying attention to this, they're getting more burnout in their physicians, more physical ailments, and then people leaving medicine because of this. And so, you know, we already know there was a statistic that was done by the AUA consensus data that came out that said that by the year 2035, between 15 to 45 percent of our urological workforce, we can have a shortage to that degree. And so when we look at those numbers and then we look at, okay, what are some things that could be contributing to that? We certainly need to do whatever we can do to preserve the current workforce we have, right? And this is one of the ways that we can do that. So need to get out there and advocate, bang on the doors of the hospital administrators, right, to get them to understand how important this issue is and invest in proper ergonomic things in the OR and in the clinics. So, you know, there was also along the same lines, I think you mentioned already that urologists, we have a variety of different surgical approaches, and maybe that puts us more in harm's way, right? We have open cases, we have vaginal cases, we have endoscopic cases, microscopic, as you described that you did today, right? Laparoscopic, robotic. And does this put us more in harm's way to some degree because of the variety that we have to do? What are your thoughts on that? Well, in one sense, maybe if you do the same thing every day, maybe you have time to really think about it and and optimize how you do that one procedure. But I do think there's actually an advantage to doing a lot of different modalities because when I work with my ergonomist colleagues and we look at the the challenges of, say, laparoscopic versus robotic versus open versus endourologic versus microscopic, they're all really different. And so I did a day of endoscopy at the end of last week and I've got open cases at the end of this week. And so The way I look at it is it's like a case mix thing. It's actually good for me because the microscope kills my neck and then the other things kill other things, other body parts, but are not necessarily as tough on my neck. So I think that at least for some of us who do, you know, a lot of variety, it can actually be a good thing. But I think the downside is just maybe not spending as much time being thoughtful about how to optimize. I do have colleagues that just all they do is robotic prostates. And so, you know, they have it down to absolute science. But they again, and you know, probably have a good team. And they have a great team. <laughs> yep. But, you know, there's the downside is that if they if they have pain in a certain area from that, it's a, like a lot of chronic stress on those muscles and joints. You know, there was a really great review that was published a couple of years ago, 2021, in Nature Reviews in Urology. Andrew Gabrielson and his colleagues, Surgical Ergonomics for Urologists, a practical guide. And there's lots of practical information there, but they really looked at their research and noted that they said, quote, unquote, the vast majority of urologists have experienced some type of work-related aches and pains and or injury. And I was pretty flabbergasted by that to think that the majority of people are probably running around with aches and pains, but just not really talking about it. I think certainly in my generation, we sucked it up, right? But I think today there's more emphasis on self-care and just trying to, you know, make sure you're taking care of yourself in the OR and in clinic. The other thing was the areas that urologists have predominant issues. And I want to hear you speak to this. It was certainly in the back and in the neck. And they had looked at some different positioning in the OR and found that urologists spend about a fourth of their OR time with their back in a position that they would be considered high risk for injury. And their neck, 55% of the time in a position that was considered high risk. So that's over half of the time. So urologists seem to be putting themselves in vulnerable positions. You know, what are those procedures or what are some things that we can do to help alleviate those vulnerable positions? 
So I think in terms of neck, which is honestly like one of the things that the vast majority of urologists will complain of if they have musculoskeletal discomfort from work. In terms of neck, it has to do with angle and it has to do with how much stuff is on your head. If you talk to an ergonomist and they have these rating systems where they can look at how long you spend in what's called a high-risk posture and OSHA will shut a factory down if they find that workers are spending too much time in those postures. And I have friends who are you know, human factors engineers who study this stuff and you're like, yeah, if OSHA could get into the OR and look at you guys, they would like they would lose it. Shut us right, down. Right, right. Shut us down. <laughs> so the, the, more, the more you essentially lean forward, your head weighs about 10 pounds. And so for every 10 degrees you go forward, you end up with like another 10 pounds of force on your cervical spine. So 30 to 40 pounds of force that your cervical muscles are trying to hold back. And then if you add loops on top of that, or you add headlight, there are a lot of things we put on our heads that weigh things and that increases that weight. So it's the angle, it's how long you spend there, it's how still you are, and it's how much weight's on your head. And I think a lot of it too has to do with your cumulative time spent in surgery and whether you have recovery time after that. So there's a lot of variables. But when we think about how do we fix it? I mean, there's certain things that you just can't not do, right? There's certain positions you have to get into and do the job. But I think thinking about things like the focal length on your loops, like most of us got our loops when we were residents. And probably there was a rep who said, well, like, if you were going to read or if you were going to do something like fine with your hands, where would you do it? And then they measured and that's how they set your focal length. But now you're in attending and you're doing RPLDs open. It's way further than it was when you were a resident doing like a scrotal case or something like that. And so, you know, most but most people are still wearing their same loops from residency. And that's the habit they've gotten into. And they would feel odd if they actually switched. But I think those are the kind of things we need to think about is uh, like I've had staff that I've taken pictures of in the operating room. I'm like, can you stand up more? And they're like, no, I can't see. And it's because of the focal length of their loops or they've got progressives. They can't get their you know, line of sight to line up right. So I think there are a lot of things like that we have to be cognizant of that are driving our bad ergonomic habits. So can we make some adjustments in terms of those adjuncts that we need to, you know, we want to see detail, you need loops. Well, there's decl- like high declination loops now where they actually, you can keep your head more forward, but the loop is actually like pointed more down. And that allows you to see without tipping your neck forward so much. So there's some technology that's changing, but also I think, you know, we need to reassess like, oh, okay, maybe I do need two sets of loops depending on what what I'm doing. And then there are, you know, things that like we mentioned briefly earlier, just things in your environment like your screen height. You know, your screen should sort of be the top of your screens, like in terms of like your surgical monitors, so fluoro and like a camera monitor for endoscopic cases. Should the top of the screen should be at about your eye level. And then your eyes, your gaze should be what we call gaze down. So about 15, 20 degrees down. That's actually the most relaxed angle for your ciliary muscles in your eye. So it reduces eye strain. But it should also be square in front of you. So where you're working and your screen need to be aligned. And you're like me. We trained when the lap was all on a tower and you sort of operated in one direction and you turned your head in another direction. You looked at the screen. And at least now, you know, technology, there's some booms and we have the ability at least start to line things up better. But when I walk around to ORs, people have their screens much too high. And so then they're tilting their head back. And for people who wear bifocals or progressives, they tilt it back even more because they're trying to look through like the lower part of the lens. So there are those uh, environmental things like screens, bed heights, important So adjusting the bed. Well, that was something I was going to ask you. Yeah. What do you think is like the perfect, how do we determine what's going to be the best table height? That one's hard because, you know, I think some of us think, well, I'm the attending now. And so we get to do it my way. (laughs) I also feel like I've got a six foot six resident, you know, I'm not going to give him a neck ache. So really, ideally, you should adjust the table to the tallest person, put everybody else on a step. That's sometimes hard for those of us who like standing mats, which can help with leg fatigue. But there are new, some new steps now that actually have a, like a mat that fits on the top of the of the step or the riser. 
But yeah, just to the tallest person and then raise everybody else up. But that can be a little tricky. You got foot pedals. You want to keep the foot pedal in line with your foot. That can be hard on a step. There's a lot of moving parts and, and a lot of things that, that have to be adjusted. So actually, Andrew Gableson and I have talked a lot about having like the, the ideal like ergonomics timeout should happen like right after the all stop or the timeout for surgery. And that's when you talk about these things. Let's get the table at the right height. Let's put the screens down. Let's you know, decide if we're going to do micro breaks during this case, things like that. So at least everybody's on the same page and we thought about it because I think a lot of times we just walk in and however somebody set it up is sort of how we do it. Yeah. Well, and sometimes the reality is the way somebody set it up in order to change it the way you need it, it might mean moving the bed around or it might mean something which is going to take a lot of time, a lot of energy. The person's intubated on one end. How are you going to move the bed around or whatever it is. So again, that's where you just sort of suck it up and say, okay, I guess we're doing it this way, even though I know ergonomically this isn't correct. You mentioned a really great point I wanted to get into is, you know, having it as part of our regular timeout. First of all, have enough people educated in the OR about what proper ergonomics are, what are the pieces of it, and then doing a proper timeout. And how would you recommend we go about really initiating that. I guess that would be individualized at each hospital first, again, working with the hospital administrators. But, you know, we almost do have a universal timeout process. It might be a little different from one hospital to another, but there is the World Health Organization has one as well, right? So we're, how do we get ergonomics incorporated into that? What we've done at Michigan is the last question of our all stop, which is the, a brief, which is earlier, and then there's timeout. And that all stop or timeout, the last question is, do you have any other concerns? What some of us have started to do is just we put our, because we have right now a surgeon-led timeout. And so we're already the ones talking. And so we've actually just put that at the bottom that this is sort of the ergonomics timeout. And that's when we talk about those things. And it's especially important if you're going to do intermittent breaks during surgery, because that requires like one of the circulators usually to set a timer. So you need to like communicate that piece. So it's a good time to say, all right, well, let's set the bed, set the screens and we're going to we're going to break every 45 minutes and do a stretch. So so when you say a break, can you give us an example? What are you doing? So every 45 minutes, everybody that scrubs steps back and raises their hands over their head or, you know, I suppose you could, but you know, it's one of the actual the few ergonomics interventions in intraoperatively that's actually been shown in small trials to be effective for pain. And interestingly, for increasing sort of surgeon perceived sort of mental clarity and no increase in operative time, which of course is what everybody's worried about. So micro breaks, as they've been called, we call them team stretch. You know, they're essentially 60 seconds of stretches and Mayo has like put out an app called OR Stretch that you can download that will actually remind you. We do ours based on posters on the wall. So there's a lot of low-tech and high-tech ways to do it, but essentially it's 60 seconds of stretches and it focuses mostly on areas that we know are areas of typical pain for most surgeons. And then I have friends who sort of deviate from that and they, they kind of put in specific stretches that they feel like they need for, for the modality that they're using. So you can certainly personalize it, but I think the hardest part of that is how do you operationalize that? How do you remember? And one of the things that's been fun as we've done this implementation study at Michigan is getting the whole team involved. So, well, we surveyed everybody and realized everybody has pain. In fact, like our script techs have worse pain than we do as surgeons because they do it every day. And so the whole team, including anesthesia, circulators, everybody stops and everybody stretches. And so it's also been interesting that sort of improved kind of team dynamics as sort of a side effect. So. I mean, really, to get into the nitty gritty, what kind of stretches do you do while staying sterile? I assume you don't break scrub and then re-scrub. No, you don't. The typical stretches tend to be related to your neck, upper back, but they're very sort of, you know, you're like not bending double or anything. So like the, they were designed specifically not to cause you to get anybody in the room mad at you for having like touched something you shouldn't. But it's mostly neck, upper back, will be a low back. And some sort of twists too. People can find those online and there's published papers that, and there's a couple different sort of routines that other people have studied, but in general, it, it's all pretty similar. Well, it's interesting. We've, we've talked about OR breaks for the patients 
for years, right? Even during my training, we talked about that in very, very long cases, how we can move their legs up and down to make sure there's circulation so that they don't get a DVT, but we never pay attention to the people who are working in the OR. So I'm glad that there's finally some some emphasis there. You know, I think it's interesting you said that because surgeon culture has been a huge barrier to all sorts of things related to well-being. But when I think about as a surgeon educator, if I can't teach a resident to operate safely for 30 or 40 years, then I haven't really done my job. And I feel like we've had this suck it up culture for so long that we've really hurt ourselves. And I think that's what needs to change. And it's not you know, there, there is no shame in taking care of your body. If you look at a professional athlete, what do they do? I mean, they really, they have trainers. The fact that we just think that we can go in and like tear up our body physically and oftentimes mentally and just sort of get up and do it again and again and again is, it, I think it's like, it's hubris. But culture change can happen. And it's very slow. But I, I do think that things are looking brighter for the future. So that makes me think of another thing I came across doing some reading. You know, there were a few articles that they talk about different things we can do in the OR, but they also seem to place a lot of responsibility on the physician themselves. And they even attributed to that a physician needs to maintain their own physical competence, right? In other words, we need to be working out and be strong. And if our back is giving out, it's partially our fault. What do you think about that? Well, it sort of reminds me of the, the whole thing. You can't, you can't like yoga yourself out of being burned out, right? I mean, there's there are structural and systemic forces at work and cultural forces at work, and we work inside a system. Now, if that system had a warm-up room for me and a trainer and a post-surgery masseuse, then I wouldn't have as much pain, right? But I do think that there's actually some good data showing that people who are in better shape have less pain. It's a little hard to suss out, is it the chicken or the egg? Do people quit working out because they have pain or does working out protect you? But I think that there's evidence that working out probably is protective. And we know just based on, you know, research in non-surgeons that as we age, even starting in like I hate to say it, like our 40s and 50s that we start to lose muscle mass. And, you know, so like actually actively doing stretching and lifting and aerobic exercise is really important just generally. But I think because you know, we finish our training in our 30s, most of us. So we're not far from those years. So it's been most of our surgery working years and years where we're losing muscle mass. And so I do think we have a responsibility to, to do our best. But I also think that that does not mean that the sort of organizational and systemic forces should be ignored because I think they're very, very strong. And it's what often drives us to work late instead of working out. Yeah. I took issue with the uh, almost blaming component of the comments that I read. And I thought, I totally agree with you. The better off we are in shape, you know, life is easier, right? Let alone just surgery. So everything is better. You know, another thing I came across was a statistic that noted that physicians who are more experienced, i.e. have been practicing for longer and then have larger surgical caseloads, more than 250 cases, seem to have less problems than people who had less cases. And they were referring to, it seemed like there are more musculoskeletal problems among the younger surgeons and residents, and then people who've only been out in practice for a handful of years. I don't know if that's more part of the culture that you were talking about, that we've been in this kind of culture where we're trained to just, you know, take what you give us. And again, to use the term we've already said three times, suck it up. And I think the younger culture that's coming in is looking at more of self-care. So we hear about it more, or if it's really that we're not training our residents well enough, right? And so uh, to your point. I think some of that's actually statistics. So you can see biases in groups based on the fact that there's attrition out of those groups. So if you imagine that a cohort of people enter surgery and then works for 30 years, but some of those people either back off on their operative practice or quit or whatever, they never become sort of those senior sur surgeons with huge practices. So, you know, just from a stats standpoint, I'm never 100% sure that I can really believe that that's a result of a high volume practice. You know, I see what you're saying, the stronger surviving. Right. Yeah. In some ways, 
I would also say that, you know, there are some senior surgeons, well, let's put it this way, people who came and trained in like new modalities that were novel, like robotics or whatever, that were sort of novel 20 something years ago or whatever. And they have a high volume practice now over time sort of have often honed that practice. Like we were talking about earlier, they have a great team. They have this setup. They A lot of people who have super high volume practices do a lot of the same surgery over and over. So they're motivated to have a super efficient setup that doesn't hurt them. And many of them have like very experienced teams. So in some sense, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy that if you do a lot of something and you optimize it, that you're probably going to optimize it for your own comfort to a certain degree, or at least to that you could tolerate. But the other thing I think is cultural is that very senior surgeons, even if they did hurt, would not call it pain. I interviewed a, a colleague actually who quit operative urology, was a you know, well-known urologic oncologist and, and quit operating probably 10 years before he had planned to because of pain and told his story at a grand round. And yet, I don't think he said the word pain, but maybe once. He said discomfort and he said stiffness about 20 times. So like there's just this sense that like, well, that doesn't really hurt. So, you know, I do think that like even in how we talk about things and how we respond to surveys, there's generational differences and cultural differences that that kind of vary based on people's age. So, yeah, I think there's some truth potentially to a high, high volume people having more efficient and maybe less pain because, like you say, the strong have survived. But I don't think it's because they're high volume. I think high volume for most people can be painful. Yeah. And high volume, as you said, to your point, equates to efficiency and probably a good team and you have all the resources you need to allow yourself to be high volume. So that's really a great point. Again, another reason to really search for good, knowledgeable, helpful teams, right? And build a team. We talk about that all the time, but I think, and we all strive for that, but I think You know, I certainly have noticed in my own institution that that has fallen apart a bit uh, post-COVID. And I hear from other colleagues across the country how much that's fallen apart as well. And everyone trying to scramble to try and rebuild. And hopefully we will see, yeah, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Well, that's actually something that I think is really important to remember when you think about ergonomics is that, you know, I was surprised in in our work to find that how much pain the scrubs had. And so, you know, being mindful of the fact that, you know, if you want to, and these scrubs are like their average age is 30, right? Surgeons, we were surveying the average age was in the 40s. So we have younger people with more pain and more consistent pain. And we're not talking like a rating of two. We're talking like four, five, six, seven on a vast scale. So it's real pain. And so thinking about like, how do we try and think about our team, not just our, us, or maybe our resident, but like the whole team, not just maybe around the table, but in the whole room, can we optimize the the ergonomics, everyone there so that we can keep good teams for our careers? Yeah, that's a great point. And oftentimes the people who are helping us in the OR are just trying their best to help us and not get in the way, which often means they're putting their body in compromising positions as they're trying to not block the view, but bending over funky, right? And um, just trying to do their best. So yeah, that's a really good point. You know, as the lead surgeon, lead person in the OR, you know, look around and see the people who are helping you and make sure their body mechanics are where it needs to be as well. It's not just about you. Yeah. I did an interview recently at sort of our summit of interviews for the study. And and one of the surgeons said, yeah, that that was the most surprising thing she learned through the whole process was how much pain her scrub had. And she said, it really made me think where I placed my medical student at the table might impact like how many Advil my scrub is popping at night. And she was like, that just really like hit me in a way like I didn't expect. So I think really starting to think about our teams as like a very valuable resource that that we want to keep and that we can make sure they have the tools they need to be healthy too. So I guess, is are there any things that are particular you think that where a lot of the recommendations that are made might be viewed differently if it's a male surgeon versus a female surgeon? Or do you think across the board, unless the female is pregnant, obviously that opens up another box of thought process, right? I was going to say can of worms, but that doesn't sound very positive. Pregnancy is positive. But I mean, you know, makes you, you know, cognizant of where the weight is and what that's doing to your back and how should I be in the OR and taking breaks, things like that. But I guess even pregnancy aside, just male, female, 
I think we're so, you know, mostly it's surgery has been a male dominated field and much of the adaptations have just taken men in consideration. But are there some considerations that we should be thinking about that are specific to women or is just more of a size discrepancy issue? So I think that there, so there is some size issue. I mean, obviously when you like are operating with a colleague who's a lot taller, that can be a problem. But at the robot, you know, they're over some heights and under some heights can be problematic. So both directions. So people are under 5'4 can sometimes struggle to kind of get that console optimized. But I think the other issue is more about hands. There's a difference in hand size, which people have talked about in the past. But a lot of it's more about hands, intrinsic hand strength. So people will complain about like being able to fire staplers one-handed. And the reason for that is that a lot of this equipment was designed in the 80s and it was designed for like two standard deviations of normal of the population at the time, which was heavily male. So I mean, it was designed for the population then, but that's not 2023. And you know, some of that, again, is a systemic issue. Like the FDA, is, it's not easy to take a device back and sort of rejigger things for a different population And I think on top of that, to be honest, like women don't want to be seen as like whining or like being needy. You know, like I said, it's been a male dominated specialty and we've all felt like I have to be one of the boys, so I'm not going to say anything. It's not uncommon to be able to palm, like palm certain instruments or, you know, just certain things that like they're on average, some women will say they have a harder time doing than men. And that's not to say that they're not men who have a hard time doing some of that stuff too. But I would say those, that hand stuff is like when one gender difference. The other thing is that women's hands tend to be more flexible. And so like I remember even in residency having awful hand pain and my doctor actually like sent me to physical therapist and they gave me these like hand strength and like gadgets and it made the pain worse. And then they realized, oh, you have hand pain because your hand's so flexible. And I was doing a lot of open surgery and I they would have me holding back the bowel for hours. And so I've got, and I have to activate every muscle in my hand. And my male colleagues just put their hand in and relaxed it because their hand like wasn't as flexible. And so for those of us who have like a lot of extra flexibility and women tend to be a little bit more flexible, but then if you're on the Ehlers-Danlos spectrum somewhere and you're like really flexible, then really is an extra challenge. So I think there are enough women surgeons now are kind of pushing for reform in that area and the industry starting to actually like realize there's a market but hopefully we'll start to really see um, some some different options for people. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I know I've heard of some of that as well with the hands and the surgical instruments. And should they be developed a little more with different hand sizes in mind? And I know there is work in that direction. So speaking of work in that direction or in other ergonomic directions, what kind of research are you involved in? right now that's dealing in uh, with this topic. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you're looking into? Yeah. So like I mentioned earlier, we're doing this implementation trial looking at how do we help people operationalize micro breaks or get them in their real world practice. And what prompted this was the original work on micro breaks was done like seven or eight years ago. And even at Mayo, which was one of the sites where they did the studies, almost 90% of the surgeons that were surveyed at the end were like, yes, I like these, I'm going to do them. And then one of my collaborators, who's an ergonomist, went back to the OR to do a different study and she would run into all kinds of surgeons like, oh, right, I need to do my stretches. And they had just completely forgotten about them. And so again, it's about like our intent, like you can believe that it works. They had actually participated in a trial, so they had experience that it worked. And yet, still forget to do something. You know, it's like my intent to exercise. And I know it's good for me. And I still, at the end of the day, sometimes it's like 10 o'clock at night. I'm like, to do it. You know, how do we really operationalize that? And so trying to figure out very practical ways to work that into workflow. And so that's been really challenging. And yeah, so we have, so that's one project. And then um, I was just saying those efforts would make it then the norm rather than the outlying anomaly, right? So it's hard exactly. to do something when you're right. the outlier and right. always have to be the one to say, we're going to do this. And maybe a few people in the OR roll their eyes, say we have to do this because <laughs> it's Dr. Sutherland or Dr. Krauser, right? But you make it normalized, right? And then what other, what other studies are you involved in? Are you involved in some others? 
we're working on a, we haven't really turned it into a study yet, but it's, it's a topic that seems to really resonate with a lot of reviewers because I've written a lot of educational stuff on ergonomics. And I've started to put in advice for people who hit their 40s or are becoming presbyopic and you know, sort of how to make those adjustments in the operating room and the fact that like as you switch to either bifocals or progressives that you can actually cause ergonomic issues because you throw your head back. And so we're actually, we're, I'm working with an ophthalmologist and an optometrist on like a checklist that's specialized for surgeons that they would take in when they get new glasses to make sure that they don't need specialized glasses or like workspace glasses for either the OR or the clinic or computer that will just, you know, essentially help their eye providers understand kind of the work context and that, you know, they really need to optimize their eyesight. So that's been exciting just because there, there seems to be every time I write a paper, that's what all the reviewers talk about is I think maybe the reviewers are all midlife and so they find it interesting. And ha- have all started wearing cheaters themselves, right? So they can right. totally relate, <laughs> exactly. myself included. Yeah. So yeah, we're, we're designing a study to assess that, but that's an exciting thing. And the other thing I just finished working on was a new chapter in Campbell's on urologist occupational health. And so it also covers ergonomics. And so nice. that's a, that's, I feel like the fact that, that Campbell's has decided that this is a topic worth dedicating some pages to is a, is a big deal and really honored to be a part of that. That's wonderful. Yeah. And that certainly will help to disseminate all of that information, especially to our learners. So to that point, that's a good segue into your thoughts about, you know, making some formal training in ergonomics part of the ACGME residency requirements, right? So should the ACGME really even take this on? And because it's such an important, important topic, and really we're looking to protect our future workforce. Absolutely. And I think in some ways, the ACGME is edging up to that. You know, they've started to include requirements about, you know, resident well-being and stress management and things like that. And so to me, this solidly falls within the realm of well-being. But from the standpoint of an educator, I feel strongly that that we must train people to operate safely or we really haven't trained them. I think that the, again, culture is one of the barriers to that. And I think things are changing. All the surveys we've done have shown that People feel they didn't have enough ergonomic education and they wish they had. And when they didn't get it in residency, they, they're they interested in that as faculty or, or you know, post, post-graduate. I think there's a lot of very simple things that we can teach to help people. And again, this isn't, this isn't rocket science. Like, I'm a big fan of the book Atomic Habits, just that these tiny incremental things that we can do can make a big difference if, fast forward 30 years. And so... You know, I think that it's not just teaching someone like this is how you should set up your screen. It's how do you operationalize that in your workflow so it happens every day and it's just what you do. And as an institution, when you think about how do you implement whatever ergonomic initiative you're looking at, it's how do you make it stick and how do you make it just what this is how we do it here. And those are big challenges, but I don't think there's any reason that we can't. It's not that difficult the activities or the changes themselves aren't that difficult, but the habits and the, the workflow integration piece of it, that's that's tough. Well, and normalizing it, again, to repeat what we said earlier, is normalizing it. You're not the anomaly trying to do this in your OR, but we make this part of core residency education, right? Our future workforce is coming out with this knowledge, and it's totally normalizing it. And that's what we really need to do, just much like we're trying to normalize just overall well-being, right? It's been such a focus. So, well, and we did a curriculum for general surgery. Um, they have this curriculum called SCORE, which is like an online curriculum. And so I worked with some colleagues to build an ergonomics module for that. So that's out there in the general surgery realm. It's just, I feel like urology, it's a little bit of catching up to do, but we'll get there. Yeah. Well, you're helping to catch us up. So thank you for all the work that you are doing. It's been really interesting. And really exciting to have you on the Back Table Urology Podcast, Dr. Krauser. Thanks so much. It's great to chat with you. This is your host, Suzette Sutherland. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. 
If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at underscore Backtable on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable is hosted by Aditya Bagrodia and Jose Silva. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz, with support from Devante Delbrun. Social media and PR by G. Dang. Administrative support provided by Jimmy Lee Kennebrew. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.